Hello and welcome to the third talk in our Knowledge in Motion, Science and Medicine in the Islamic World lecture series. I'm Zilke Ackerman, I'm the director of the History of Science Museum and it is a great pleasure to have you with us today. The lecture series is part of our current exhibition uh, that come the um, precious and rare Islamic metalwork from the Courtauld juxtaposed with objects from our own collection to form cultures in conversation. If you're unable to visit the exhibition in person, then please have a look online. You will find an expanded version there that also includes a tour by the curator. Given that it's almost Christmas and a festive period for many of you and us, uh, we have a special treat in store, a talk on board games and medieval medicine. And I can honestly say this was the most fun project, the most fun research project, I should say, that our museum has ever been participated in. We had to try all the games at staff meetings. Now, that was really rather good. Our speaker tonight is Daniel Burt in his main job, ICT officer at the Khalili Research Center the University Center for the Study of Islamic Art and Material Culture here in Oxford. Dan has spent the last 15 years of his career working in the field of digital humanities, developing software to aid with academic research. But outside that work, he has been developing board games for almost 30 years. So those two um, parts of his expertise uh, made him the perfect person to be involved in the Literary History of Medicine project. Dan has kindly agreed to take questions at the end, so if there's anything you would like to ask, then please put that in the chat and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Also, if you would like to support our free lecture series and our work in general, we would be hugely grateful for your donation. Uh, details of how to give online will appear in the chat during the lecture, just to make that a tiny little bit easier. But now, without further ado, over to you, Dan. Thank you, Zilka. But most of all, thank you all for joining me for the talk this evening. Um, if I can continue with some thanks and then a quick apology, um, I'd like to thank Professors Emily Savage-Smith and Simon Swain, Chris Parkin and Suki Trowles, and particularly the Wellcome Trust for all of their support with, and help with this project. Um, as my family, friends and colleagues will attest, I can talk for an inordinate and possibly bordering on an insufferable length of time about board games. And you'll be grateful to hear that my time this evening has been limited. This does mean that I have to be quite ruthless in timing and content as I want to cover both the project that I worked on and its outputs, and then to look in more detail at a fascinating 13th century manuscript that I encountered when working on creating the games. But if there are any aspects you'd like me to discuss in more depth that I've skipped over, please do submit a question to the organisers during the talk and I'll try to answer it. Um, at the last, series, last of these series of talks, Professor Julia Bray prefaced her talk by apologising for not being a historian of science and medicine. And I must start by confessing that I'm also not a historian of science or medicine, and furthermore, I'm not an Arabist or indeed a scholar of any note. Um, however, as fate would have it, and fate plays a prominent role in this talk, from April 2016 until October 2017, I worked on a project to create board games on the subject of medieval Islamic medicine as an offshoot of a wider translation project called the Literary History of Medicine. ALHOM, or the Literary History of Medicine project, was a joint project between the Universities of Oxford and Warwick, funded by the Wellcome Trust. It began in 2014, with its primary output being the first comprehensive translation and critical edition of the best accounts of the classes of physicians. Ibn Abi Yusabia's manuscript, which was written in Damascus in the mid-13th century, is, to quote the project's application for funding, not only the earliest comprehensive history of medicine, but the most important and ambitious of the medieval period incorporating accounts of over 442 physicians, their training, practice and medical compositions, 
all interlaced with amusing poetry and anecdotes illustrating their life and character. Late 2019 and early 2020 saw the publication of the two key outputs of the main translation project, being a five volume critical commentary and translation of Ibn Abi Asabia's History of Medicine, published by Brill, and an accompanying trade paperback in OUP's World Classics series. A key parallel output to these two publications is an open access digital version of the main text, and this is available online at the address shown below uh, this screenshot. So how and why have board games become part of this project? Well, the answer as to how this happy union came to fruition is, as I say, largely the result of fate, which is a theme that we'll look at in more detail over the course of this talk. My role in the main Alhorn project was to set up and support the IT systems used for the collaborative translation work, which meant that I was present at various project meetings held by the team. And at one of these meetings, the subject of public engagement was raised, and I was asked about the possibility of developing digital games using the outputs of the team's research. The Wellcome Trust has supported many such projects, and you can see here some games that were developed as part of the X-Play Game Jam that the Trust ran as far back as 2012. I have some experience of games development and actually began my career in IT working in the game industry in the mid-1990s. Um, the budget for public engagement within the Alhorn project was generous, but not excessive, and computer games cost a lot of money to develop. As you can see in this chart, simple games can be made at very low cost, but most games are going to cost at least six figures to develop. However, board and card games can be self-produced, and individual printing costs for prototypes have fallen hugely in the last five to ten years following the rise of print-on-demand publishing. So I suggested that should games be the desired avenue of public engagement, we could approach a trust with the idea of developing board and card game prototypes that could be played with the general public. So we went away and formulated a plan and applied for additional funding that would allow us to partner with the Museum of the History of Science so that we could develop some prototype games, test them with the general public and report back on the results of this work. The trust agreed to the plan, and this allowed the project to employ a dedicated education officer to spearhead the project at the museum, Suki Trowles, and I was able to spend just over two days a month for 18 months developing games that would be used at the museum as part of the project. That very short introduction doesn't do justice to the importance of the Alhorn project, and I encourage all of you to read the trade paperback and have a look at the online text and commentary. But now I'm going to move on to providing you with an overview of the board games and medieval medicine project itself. The first game that was produced was Al-Kitab, and this is a set collection game about manuscripts and was based on an existing game by Phil Walker Harding called Archaeology. The game proved popular with visitors to the museum and it aimed to focus on the history of manuscript collection and the difficulty in gathering and maintaining these important sources of knowledge. In this game, players collect sets of manuscripts and score points by submitting them to the library of the Mansuri Hospital in Cairo. There are cards for important manuscripts from the period, important centres of knowledge, including Oxford. I was very surprised to discover that scholars from the Arabian Peninsula were visiting Oxford as long ago as the 13th century. Threats to these uh, manuscript collections came in the form, or comes in the form of things like fire, bookworm, theft, and even invasion by the Mongols. Whilst these collections can be protected by the use of copyists or warak, or even buttercups, which were tr traditionally um, left inside manuscripts to ward away bookworm. And in fact, um, in later manuscripts, if there was no uh, buttercup available, you would often find just the word buttercup written in the front of the manuscript. As the first game underwent testing with the schools and family groups of the museum, I began to work on an original game focused on pharmacy during the Middle Ages, tentatively titled Sidana. This game made... 
However, its relative complexity and longer running time meant that it proved unsuitable for these engagement activities. So I went back to the drawing board. I still wanted shorter sessions. To achieve this, I decided to take a very simple mechanic, which is used in memory games for children, and see if I could, you, could base a game about pharmacy around it. This meant that I was able to reuse much of the research I'd done for the previous game. Each turn, players would draw a recipe from a deck of cards and would then turn over tiles to try to match the sequence of ingredients shown on those cards. We were able to start testing this game very quickly and it proved to be very popular not only with the younger players but also their parents. And during the course of testing and development, I recognized that there was also some potential to develop another version of this game, which would be more challenging, but would use more of the same, uh, would use much of the same materials and content. And this game developed into Aldecan, the second main output of the development project. All of these pharmacy games aim to introduce players to the treatments that were, that were available in the Middle Ages the ingredients that made up these treatments and the ailments that they were prescribed for. These four different games continue to be played within with the general public, both at the museum and at other public events, alongside game-based object trails that were developed internally in the museum by Suki Trowels and Chris Parkin. And these now form part of the educational outreach activities offered by the museum. Although the project had officially now come to a conclusion, I had a further prototype that I had been working on and I was keen to finish. Tigris is based on Takaido by Antoine Bowser, and in this game players are competing to become the most famous physician in 13th century Iraq as they journey along the river Tigris, stopping to gather manuscripts, purchase materia medica, and treat patients at the four caravanserais that they pass on their travels. And here you can see the board and some of the components from the digital version of the game. Whilst working on Tigris, I also developed a mini game comprising just nine cards, a handful of wooden counters and some dice, which use much of the same um, research and artwork that I'd gathered for the main game. These cards show some of the characters featured in the game, the materia medica they may collect on their travels, and the patients awaiting treatment at the caravan Sarai. And here are the nine cards that made up the um, mini game that uh, was developed alongside Tigris. And this was based on a game called uh, Six Sons of the Sultan by Todd Sanders. This is a very quick and portable game and it sees two players competing to become the chief physician and task them with dividing their time between study, pharmacy, treatment and activities within the court to see who comes out on top. Playable versions of Al-Kitab, Al-Dakan, Tigris and Al-Sar can be found on the Board Games and Medieval Medicine Project website, along with links to resources that we found helpful during the course of our project and a summary of the outcomes of the project as a whole. There are also recordings of some talks that were given and links to the main outputs of the parent translation project. There are many other elements of the project that could be discussed at this point, including a closer look at the processes and pitfalls of playtesting, software that can be used to aid in prototyping board games and card games, tips and advice on physical prototypes, not to mention more esoteric discussions regarding themes and mechanics and how games can be used to simulate questions or problems that relate to academic research. But to do these justice would require me to keep you here a rather long time. And I'm keen to talk about the manuscript that I mentioned earlier, as I believe it's a fascinating document and that it supports the work and the central hypothesis of the wider board games and medieval medicine project. These images show pages from Libro de los Juegos, the Book of Games, created for Alfonso X of Castile, Galicia and León in 1283. 
The earliest known copy of this manuscript is held at the Escorial Monastery uh, Library in Madrid. These pages show, uh, these images indeed, show pages from the Libro de los Juegos, the Book of Games, um, which was created for King Alfonso X um, of Castile, Galicia and Leon in 1283. Uh, the earliest known copy of this manuscript is held at the Escorial Library in Madrid and the manuscript is 40 centimetres high, 28 centimetres wide and comprises 97 leaves of parchment. Uh, before Libro de los Juegos, Alfonso X, shown here dictating this book to his scribes, had previously written a major treatise called Las Siete Partidas, or Seven Part Code, which was completed in 1265. The text was originally known as Libro de las Leyes, or the Book of Laws, and is in essence an attempt by Alfonso to both govern and understand the, di the diverse groups of people who were living under his rule. Passages within the text address nearly all aspects of the lives of his subjects, and they include explicit reference to pastimes, with particular emphasis placed on their importance as sources of relaxation and comfort, particularly for kings and rulers. Given his obvious fascination with games, it's perhaps not surprising that Alfonso, who is known to his subjects as the wise king, chose to follow this first work with a book entirely dedicated to the study of games. But what is perhaps surprising is the importance to which Alfonso ascribed the activities of both game playing and game design. In the opening text of Libro de los Juegos, Alfonso asserts that games not only bring todo manera de alegría, or all manner of joy, but that they are tools that can aid with the understanding of the challenges of life. In his article on Alfonso's book of games titled The King is Dead, Long Live the Game, Fidel Fajardo Acosta writes, Game playing and game design rather than escapes or self-contained spaces outside the real world, constituted for Alfonso a place of reflection into which he could retreat to draw or redraw a course of action, a serious playground for the troubleshooting, troubleshooting and testing, design and redesign of strategies and moves that could be applied to the real world. In the examples I showed you of the games produced as part of the project, I hope to teach players about the outputs of the main translation project, the geography, social structure, literature and ailments and treatments that were covered in this voluminous text. But what are the lessons and questions that interested Alfonso? At the beginning of the Book of Games, after the initial dedications, Alfonso recounts a story. As it is told in the ancient histories of India, there was a king who greatly loved his wise men and had them always with him, and he made them very often to reason over the nature of things. And of these he had three there who had various opinions. The one that the one said that brains were worth more than luck, because that he he that lived by his brain did things in an order, orderly fashion, and even if he lost, that he was not to blame in this, because he did what suited him. The other said that luck was worth more than brains, because if his fortune was to lose or to win, no matter how much brains he might have, he could not avoid it. The third one said that best was he who could live drawing upon the one and the other, because this was prudence, because the more brains he had, the more care he could take to do things as completely as he could, and also the more he depended upon luck, the greater there would be his risk, because it is, it is not a certain thing. But truest prudence was to take from the brain that which man understood was most to his advantage, and from luck man should protect himself from harm as much as he could, and to help himself with what was to him an advantage from it. And after they had spoken their reasons very zealously, the king ordered, therefore, that each one should bring an example to prove that which they had said, and he gave them the time period they requested, 
and they went away and consulted their books, each according to his opinion. And when the time arrived, they each came before the king with their example. And the one whose opinion was brains brought chess with its pieces, showing that he who had more brains and who was more perceptive could beat the other. And the second, whose opinion was fortune, brought dice, showing that brains mattered nothing without luck, because it seemed through luck that men came to their advantage or harm. The third, who said that it was best to draw from both, brought the table's board with its pieces counted and placed orderly in their spaces, and with its dice which moved them in order to play, as is shown in this book which speaks separately about this, and which teaches that, through their play, he who knows how to play them well, even though the luck of the dice be against him, that because of his prudence he will be able to play his pieces in such a manner as to avoid the harm that may come to him through the rolls of the dice. The main text of Libro de los Juegos is, di is divided into three parts, reflecting this relationship between free will and determinism. The first part focuses on chess, a game purely of abstract strategy. The second section concerns dice games, with outcomes controlled strictly by chance. And the last section is on backgammon, or tables, which combines elements of both in its mechanics. In the opening section on the, on, uh, the game of chess shown here, we can see that Alfonso intends to not only explain how the game is played, but also how to make the board and pieces for the game, as well as to examine variants and puzzles within the game itself. The final sentence provides us with a further indication of how Alfonso related the outcomes of these games to situations in ordinary life, and would indicate that, with this in mind, he believed that such games provided testing grounds for real-life situations and predicaments. Staying true to his word, Alfonso begins the section on chess by explaining how the board is made. And here we see a detail from Folio 3 showing the creation of a chessboard and chess pieces. The craftsman on the left of the image is making a, bo a board of which Alfonso notes. And the figures of the board and the figure of the board is that it is to be square and it is to have eight horizontal ranks and in each flank eight squares, which are in all 64 squares. And half of the squares are to be of one colour and the other half of another, and likewise the pieces. And here on the right of the image we see a craftsman turning the wooden pieces on what looks like a bow lathe. There are to be 32 pieces, and the 16 of one colour should be arranged on the first two horizontal ranks of the board, and the 16 of the other colour are to be arranged on the other end of the board in the same way, opposite the others. Interestingly, the third main element of this image, which is the main chessboard itself, is shown from a top-down perspective that's somewhat at odds with the rest of the picture. And this stylistic approach is adopted throughout the manuscript and shows that the creator understood the need to use these illustrations to help explain the games. The remaining section on chess is divided into four chapters. A chapter on the movement of chess pieces, a chapter on how chess pieces capture, a chapter on the ranking of the chess pieces, and a lengthly titled chapter on how the king and all the chess pieces can move and capture, some in all squares of the board and others in some of them. The section ends by presenting a variety of chess puzzles along with their solutions. Again, uh, note the miniatures from this section uh, continue to use the top-down 2D perspective of the boards in contrast with the other, other illustrative elements. 
Shatranj, the Persian word for chess, is first mentioned in the Book of the Deeds of Adashir, son of Papak, a Middle Persian manuscript dating from the late 6th century uh, that was written to honour Ardashir or Artaxerxes, the founder of the Sassanid kingdom, and the game spread to Europe via the Middle East from Persia. At the time when Alfonso composed his manuscript, chess in varying forms was being played from the Northern Ireland Isles of Scotland to the Indian subcontinent. The image on the left shows the Lewis or Huyck chessmen, which date from the 12th century and are part of the collections at the National Museum of Scotland. To the right is a glazed fritware chess set dating to 12th century Iran, which is in the collections at the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. In the 14th century Arabic manuscript, The Book of the Delight of Chess, which is held in the collections at the John Rylands Library in Manchester, its author, Abu Zakaria Yahya ibn Ibrahim al-Hakim, states that Adam was the first man to play chess in order to console himself for the loss of his son. And Judaic legend maintains that chess was created by King Solomon and that he too played chess when lamenting the death of his child. This image, taken from a 14th century copy of the Shaname or Book of Kings, shows Anushiwan and his vizier mastering the game of chess. Note again the stylistic uh, use of a top-down view of the board uh, in contrast to the uh, other perspectives used in this image. There's no doubting that Alfonso held chess in the highest regard. Um, but how did chess answer the question of chance, the random nature of things? And so we move on to the second section of, man of this manuscript, the Book of Dice. As with the preceding book on chess, this book starts with a section on the production of dice. On which subject Alfonso stepped more than any other material, they fall more equally and more squarely on any type of surface. In the accompanying illustration, we can see bone being weighed. Uh, due to the fact that these games will not be as familiar as either chess or backgammon, and with time as a consideration, I can't go into much detail about their history or the mechanics of the games, but those listed include Triga or Trios, Azar or Hazard, and a number of variants of this game, Marlotta, Riffa or Raffle, Panquist, and Gigieska. Note again the continued use of the um, 2D perspective, the overhead perspective of the board in these illustrations. Bear with me. Alfonso himself is fairly dismissive of dice games and shows his cards in terms of his own personal preference with regards to game mechanics at the beginning of the section on dice games when he says, since we have now spoken about the games of chess which are played by brains as completely as we could, we want now to tell here about the games of dice for two reasons. The first, because the, the debate between the wise men, as we showed at the beginning of the book, was to between brains or luck, which was better. And on this matter, each one gave his example to the king, the first of brains by the games of chess, the second of luck by the dice. The other reason is that even though tables are greater and more respectable than dice, since they cannot be played without them, it is fitting that we speak of them first. It seems that a game based entirely on chance was not to Alfonso's liking, but he appreciated the importance of their mechanics. Dice date back millennia in history, and here we see some examples of a variety of six-sided dice dating from the Roman period. Earlier examples include this six-sided dice dating from the Harappan period of India around 2000 BC. 
This 20-sided die inscribed with Greek letters dating from the 2nd century BC to the 4th century AD, which is in the collections at the Met Museum. And these similar dice with Greek lettering, which were found in Egypt and are held at the British Museum. The British Museum also has many examples of dice in its collections, such as these four-sided dice from Mesopotamia, and these dice carved from knuckle bones that date from Thrace between the 5th and 3rd century BC. Taking a closer look at these dice in particular allows us to discuss an interesting facet of early dice-based games. As you can see, there's no standardization to these dice in terms of weight or shape, and this would obviously have a major impact on probability when it came to results from throwing them. In 2018, researchers at the American Museum of Natural History examined 110 cube-shaped dice from various sources, dating back to as far as the Roman period. And they found that their design didn't become fair until around the Renaissance period. This, according to Yemma Irkins, the professor of social anthropology at the University of California, was because People like Galileo and Blaise Pascal were developing ideas about chance and probability. And we know from written records, in some cases, they were actually consulting with gamblers. And we think users of ice also adopted new ideas about fairness and chance or probability in games. As Alfonso was writing a couple of centuries before these apparent changes, maybe this explains his aversion to purely dice-based gameplay. The researchers suggested that Roman era dice rollers were not concerned about a uniformity of shape and material in their dice, as they believed that providence or fate itself was determining the outcome of the roll. And here we see a Renaissance painting of the Roman parcae or fates. But there are many instances of dice in the cohort that were studied where they do appear to have been weighted in such a way as to favor particular outcomes something not unheard of in the histories of gambling and swindling, and dice have often been associated with gambling and other undesirable activities. An aversion to mechanics that are based purely on chance seems fairly natural to me, and it appears to be an aversion shared by Alfonso, and it's one that's existed throughout the history of game playing. And so we come to the final section of Alfonso's manuscript, the section on tables or backgammon, titled Libro de las Tablas. This section follows a very similar structure to the preceding two. And Alfonso begins by stating, Since we have spoken about the dice as completely as we were able, we now wish to speak here about the tables, though that although they might need dice to show luck, with which to be played, still they are to be played intelligently, taking therefore from where it should be required the brain, and also from luck. And he begins, as usual, by explaining how the game's components are made. The board on which they are to be played is to be square, and in the middle there is to be a mark so that four tables are made, and in each table there, there, are, there are to be six points. And in the middle of the illustration, we see a craftsman creating the board. The pieces are to be round. One half must be of one color and the other half of another so that they can be recognized one from the other. And they are to be 15 of each color. And here, uh, this is shown clearly here in this detail from an illustration on Folio 73's Verso. And you can see a craftsperson working on a lathe to create these pieces here in the left of this illustration. And here's a close up um, showing what appears to be a foot powered bow lathe in use. As with the two preceding sections, Alfonso then goes on to explain the game of tables or backgammon and a number of its variants, including Kinza Tablas or 15 pieces, a game known as Doshi Canas or Doshi Hermanos, 12 dogs or 12 brothers, Doblet or Doublet, 
Fallas or drop dead. And seis dos and as, six, two and one. Note again that the illustrations show, follow the same stylized view of the board, as we can see here. And the variety shown in the cultures, genders and social statuses of the various characters shown playing the games, as we can see here. Alfonso then introduces a game that should be afforded the highest social status. This is the game they call in Spain Emperador or Emperor because he made it. And again, here we see Alfonso reinforcing the social importance of game playing. It's not clear which emperor Alfonso is referring to, but he's suggesting that even an emperor of Spain or perhaps the Holy Roman Emperor played and designed board games. And we see in this illustration of the game two monarchs playing against each other. As with all of the games in this book, Alfonso explains how the board is set up, how each player takes their turns, and how one wins the game. And he follows uh, his discussion of Emperador with a uh, look at a variant called Medio Emperador before listing several other games played using the same board and components as Backgammon, including Perea de Entrada, or Paired Entry, Cap e Quinal, or alongside fives. Todas Tablas, or all tables, which is the most direct ancestor to the modern version of Backgammon. And La Quête, or the quest. <coughs> there are then shorter entries, all without illustrations, on games called Bufa Cortesa, or Courtly Puff, Bufa de Baldrac, or Common Puff, and a Roman game called Rayon Contract, or Ron Contra. Again, you'll see that uh, in the images of these, uh, in the illustrations of these games, the same perspective of the, the view of the board from above is used. And again, the players are shown to come from both genders and all levels of society. Alfonso then returns to the subject of chess, starting with a, with a description of great chess, of which he says, Great chess was made in India after the manner of how the old kings used to make their armies of knights and pawns and stand them in ranks to show their power and so that their enemies would fear them. Great chess is included here in the section on tables because it makes use of dice rolls to govern which pieces can move on the board. This particular chess variant uses eight-sided dice. And we can see an illustration of these dice on folio 83's Verso. Perhaps the most interesting of these chess variants is Four Seasons Chess, which you can see in this illustration. This variant is for four players and the board is divided into quadrants as shown here. And these mirror the seasons. There is another chess that the ancient wise men made after the four seasons of the year, writes Alfonso. And these four seasons are divided like the four elements. Spring is air, summer is fire, autumn is earth, winter is water. And this similarity they made according to the few four humours that grow in the body of man, like blood which they gave to spring, and choler to summer, and melancholy to autumn, and phlegm to winter. And the manuscript then contains uh, further details about this game divided into sections titled of the humours that grow in each season, how the four seasons board is made and how many colours the pieces are and how they are arranged on it and on how they are to begin to play with these pieces. And these three section headings really reflect the range of topics that are wrestled, wrestled with throughout this manuscript. The themes of philosophy, craftsmanship and instruction. After the description of these chess variants, Alfonso examines a number of traditional games that use boards, dice and counters. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip past these bits and go to 
Yeah. So <clears throat> he's talking about nine men's Morris and three men's Morris and has a variant that uh, does away with the dice and uses brains. But I will skip to the last section in the interest of time. And these, so these subjects of free will and determinism are um, discussed in greater detail in the finer group, final group of games that are discuss discussed in the manuscript. In the introduction to this final section, Alfonso says, it is fitting that another nature of game now be shown that is very noble, strange, beautiful, and of great understanding for learned men and primarily for those who know the art of astrology. And there follows a detailed description of two games, astrological checkers shown here, and the game of astrological tables, which we see in this illustration. Alfonso explains how both games model astrology in a manner as described by the wise men who divided the heavens into 12 quadrants, and that to play them requires both brains and good fortune, as with all games in the Book of Tables. The detail in which these games are described, the manner in which they're introduced, and their placement at the very end of the text, at the pinnacle of the third way in the argument between free will and determinism that runs throughout his treatise, would lead me to believe that these were Alfonso's personal favourite games, and their subject matter would seem to lend themselves to this king's evident philosophical nature. And so the manuscript concludes. This book was begun and finished in the city of Seville by order of the very noble King Alfonso, son of the very noble King Fernando and the Queen Beatriz, Lord of Castile and Leon and Toledo and Galicia and Seville and Cordova and Murcia and Jain and Badajoz and Algarve in the 32 years that the aforementioned king reigned in 1321. Note that the year 1321 is given in Spanish era dates and was the equivalent to 1283 CE. And there ends the book of uh, games, the Libro de los Juegos, which as you can see at the most basic level is an important text in the history of board games. It contains clear instructions and instructional stylized illustrations, obviously designed with the intention of being learning tools for those wishing to play the games. Alongside these instructions are useful sections on the manufacture and production of the games themselves, details of their history and provenance, and reflections and strategies on, and how, on ways to win. In parallel, in parallel with this, throughout the text, there's a philosophical discussion concerning free will and determinism, and perhaps most interestingly, a hypothesis that the games detailed in the manuscript can not only be of benefit as pastimes, but can also be used to simulate problems or situations in life and to learn how to tackle them. Alfonso was the ruler of a large and diverse kingdom that included a population made up of diverse faiths and ethnicities. And after doing the research for this paper, I believe that much as uh, in the same way that Professor Jeremy Johns has argued that King Roger adopted the traditions of art and the royal court in an attempt to create a universal language of rule in the diverse kingdom of Sicily, Alfonso believed that such a universal language for his own kingdom could be found in the form of games. The Book of Games is a carefully and conceived and crafted manuscript that exists in tandem with the preceding Book of Laws. The inclusion of illustrations showing, for example, a Jew playing chess with a Muslim, or a Saracen playing chess with a Crusader, would seem to convey Alfonso's convictions concerning the universality of games and their potential to unite people. It's possible that when writing his Book of Laws, he recognized a common interest in games in his population, or perhaps he merely transposed his own personal desires onto his subjects. Whichever may be the case, there is no doubting his conviction and deep-rooted belief in the importance of games. Alfonso is undoubtedly a fan of games, 
both of playing them and of understanding their design and mechanics and of using them to act as a mirror on the real world. That games are of value to education and understanding would be beyond doubt to the wise king. And who am I to argue? Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope you found that interesting. I shall now hand you back to Silka, our Master of Ceremonies. Thank you very much, Dan. That was fascinating. Let's look at the questions we have in the chat. Uh, the first one from Samuel. Uh, fascinating talk, he says. Absolutely Thank right. You. When you work on game designs, how do you mitigate the element of chance in card games? Well, that's a very difficult one. Um, as you probably know, there's a huge variety of ways in which cards can be used. And um, cards very, I mean, obviously, historically, they come into greater use uh, after the invention of the printing press. And then we see a huge explosion in card games, um, many of which are still played today. Some games are incredibly random, games of snap and so on are random. Then you move into more sort of esoteric games like bridge and so on, uh, traditional games like that, where there is more strategy involved. There are ways in which to negate chance, in which to use bluffing and so on. And then in terms of modern games, um, card driven games are a very much a key uh, genre of game that are produced now. Um, and they will have often cards that will have multiple effects so a card won't simply perform or have one effect when you play it it will have an effect if you play it in one way a different effect if you play it in another way um, and cards will react and play off against each other and i think that's kind of when you can start to use cards in a slightly more interesting way i'm not trying to um disrespect traditional more random card play but yeah I, I i would say that is where you start to look i mean certainly in terms of designing games and this is one of the great pleasures of it the first real thing you need to do to design games is play a lot of games so uh play as many as you can pick up um borrow i mean the the games design industry is uh very much people learning taking ideas off each other and refining these things and we're living in uh, a great period for this so yes if uh, play lots of games and if you'd like any suggestions please do email me um i believe my email should be somewhere uh, on the talk or track me down <laughs> i'm sure uh, that will happen very rapidly uh, swallen asked whether you could take uh, tell us more about games in historical research uh, or public engagement in science in general? Very interesting question. I was involved in another um, science project, which is actually run by the English faculty here, which was about um, Victorian medicine. And um, that was a quite a simple game where it had statements on the cards and you had to decide whether they were um, true contemporary truth, uh, true at the time of the Victorian medical um, diagnoses or made up by the researchers and they've been using those uh, with the Royal College of Nursing and in schools and in other uh, universities in nursing training uh, so that's that's informing the sort of medical side but they've also been using it in um, well we went down to the Science Museum in London and, and demoed it there and so on and that's just one example of another project I know in Oxford I know that um, increasingly certainly since our project the welcome has produced has uh, funded a number of other games based projects um, there are other projects around the university that I know people are working on board game ideas or card game ideas so um, this is really my main direct experience of using games in, in in that kind of environment but i am aware that there's a lot of this sort of work going on at the moment thank you we've got a question from susie here were board games usually developed for teaching purposes or were they ever created primarily for entertainment with learning as a secondary benefit 
I think it's a little bit of both, actually. Um, I mean, certainly the games we've looked at, the the dice games, the tables and uh, backgammon and chess, they're primarily there for entertainment. I mean, there is there is sort of some strategy to be learned from them. There's obviously uh, the philosophical argument and the, the great strategy that uh, Alfonso ascribes to these things. Um, but it's really sort of later, it's around... Um, the Victorian, well, no, maybe a bit before the Victorian period, you see in the early 19th century a lot of games being produced that are most definitely primarily educational games. Um, I haven't got examples in this talk, but um, in a previous talk I gave, I spoke about a few of them. And there are a lot of them actually in the collections at the uh, Bodleian Library, in the Western Library building, they have the um, John Johnson print, uh, archive of printed ephemera, I think it is. And they also have a, a more recent collection that was donated, I think about four or five years ago by a gentleman whose name I have forgotten. I have it in another lecture. Um, and they have a huge collection of board games dating back to you know the early 19th century. And very many of these are, are primarily educational. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Elizabeth who says she can see some great games in your background. What are your favorite games to play with? Oh dear, right, okay. Um, that's put me on the spot. Uh, my favorite game of all time is Dune, the uh, Avalon Hill board game from gosh, I think it's 73, 74, um, which I think was was hugely ahead of its time. It's an area control um, game with asymmetric uh, competing houses from the book of, of the book Dune by Frank Herbert. That's a fantastic game, but it does take, you need six people to play and probably at least half a day to a full day, depending on how engrossed you get. So um, more recent games, well, I love Terraforming Mars, which is um, a deck building, well, a sort of engine building um, game, which you can play solo, and I'd very much recommend that. But given our current circumstances, my top tip would be to visit a site called boardgamearena.com where you can join for free. Um, you can play certain games for free and if you join and get premium membership of it, you can play any game on there with any of your friends. And they've actually got a really good library of, of games. Um, I've been playing that uh, weekly since lockdown and I think my most played games are Tzolkin which is a game about the Mayan calendar and Keyflower which is a game about um, well ostensibly about you know uh, settling uh, a colony in the new world but it's it's more of a sort of strategy game but those are some good recommendations I hope sorry if I missed anyone <laughs> we have got uh, one, we can take one last question and I've got one here from Anne. In which age should children start playing board games according to Alfonso and where do they learn it? Gosh, well Alfonso doesn't doesn't say when at what age you should start but you know looking at the images in the in the book I mean there are certainly infants in there um I'm trying to quickly flick through and see if I can find an example, but um, I'll uh, I'll probably struggle. I mean, there are yeah, uh, children from Alfonso's perspective. I suspect he thought everyone should play games because he was obviously you know a, a fanatic, um, and uh, I personally would think. I mean, I can't persuade my daughter to play any games with me, but I've tried and I've been trying for a very long time. Um, just keep keep going. I A lot of these games I buy in the hope that, you know, I'll find a theme that will resonate with my wife or my daughter, um, but I've not managed yet. <laughs> so the very, very, very last question now. Could the irregular dice, that's a question from Ralph, could the irregular dice pieces be irregular because of a sense that chance it is, is enhanced thereby, rather than an indication the maker was trying to determine an outcome? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think that really they, uh, from what I can gather and from particularly what the, uh, the, the University of California's research uh, seemed to suggest, was there just, was 
the idea of a dice was that it, you threw the dice, but fate decided where it landed. You, you know, it wasn't the dice. It wasn't your action. It was basically, you know, it's like throwing a coin into a wishing well or something like that. Um, but uh, yes, I hope that helps. <laughs> Very good. I should also add that my colleague Stephen Johnson and I play the astrology game regularly with the students on yes. our uh, advanced course, uh, History of Astrology in Early Medieval Europe, uh, Early Modern Europe and the Islamic World. And that seems to be the most popular session of all. So much recommended. Uh, we unfortunately need to bring this to a close. And I would like to do that with a comment here from Desi who says, Great talk. I'm happy the recorded talk will be sent over. My team and I work with Arabic scientific manuscripts, and I'm sure they'll be thrilled to watch the talk. That is Great. lovely. Well, so, what I can offer to do is 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 re-record it myself, so you don't have the whole disjointed bit at the be in the middle. So I can do that and send that to you as well. Thank you. That's a very kind kind offer. Thank you, Dan. Um, our next lecture is on Thursday, the 7th of January. It is the last lecture in this series by Taha Yassin Aslan. Is science always exact? Now, that is something to ponder on over the break. Please join us for that. And in the meantime, if you would like to support uh, our free lecture series, please look out for the details in the chat. And all that remains now is for me to thank on everybody's behalf. All the thank yous are coming in in the chat, which you can't see then. So on everybody's behalf, a very big thank you from the audience and from us and for you and for all of our viewers, a peaceful festive season and a happy and healthy 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.